everybody, welcome to Paranormal Among Us. As you can tell, I am not live right now. I am out celebrating my wife's birthday, uh, out with family. Uh, but I wanted to have something for you guys uh, to watch tonight. So I went back and found a show from last year. I had interviewed this pilot from Alaska. His name is Theo Chesley. He runs a, a small airline up in Alaska, shuttling cargo and, and passengers to different uh little towns in Alaska, and he had this encounter that he shared with us, um, and I mentioned it before, uh, the last couple episodes, I mentioned it before, and uh, it's a very interesting story. So in just a few minutes, I will uh, bring that interview up uh, with uh, Theo Chesley from Alaska, but first I wanted to remind you that uh, May 18th and 19th, I will be at uh, Ashmore Estates at an event put on by After Dark Paranormal and Blondes and Booze. Uh, like I said, May 18th from 11.30 a.m. until 2 a.m. on the 19th. Uh, we will be out at Ashmore Estates. Guest speakers will include Robin Terry, Josh Hurd, and Letitia Nunley. Tickets are 85 bucks a piece, and the price of ticket includes... Uh, the daytime speaker portion of the show, uh, pizza dinner, and an overnight ghost hunt. So stay tuned. More guests, guest speakers, will be announced um, later on as we get closer. And uh, there you see the email on the bottom of the screen, blondesandbooze at gmail.com, or you can uh, send it to me at ParanormalAmongUs72, and we will, uh, I will get it to you. Uh, so get your tickets now. It's going to be a fun event. Can't wait. Looking forward to seeing everybody out there. All right. Here is my interview from last year with Theo Chesley. Enjoy it. And Theo Chesley, thank you for joining me up in Alaska near uh, Anchorage. How you doing, Theo? Oh, doing good. Doing just good. fine. Good. Awesome. Thank you for joining me. Um, and you're the uh, the owner of Precision Air up there, right? That is correct. What what exactly do you do you do? Just you take passengers places or what's what what do you do? Oh, uh, we do it all. We're twin engine charter. We're just basically glorified taxi drivers. When we get mm -hmm. a call, somebody wants to move either freight or uh passengers or both or anything, we'll we pretty much fly everything. And how long have you been flying up in Alaska? Oh, let's see, I've been flying by 30, 38 years, not all of it in Alaska. I've flown all over the United States, uh, Miami, Midwest, L.A. Basin, uh, Las Vegas, Grand Canyon, Northwest, all over. So you've had plenty of, of years of experience uh, flying um, around this uh, the country of ours. Um, and, and you had an incident back in uh, 2019. Oh, uh, we actually had two incidents, uh -huh. uh, but yes, 2019, actually, I believe it was, uh, thinking back now, I believe it was October of 2019 and then April of 2020, but that might be 18 and 20. I'm not, I, it's been a while. I haven't even, I haven't looked at the dates, you know, <laughs> in, in a while. Yeah. It's already 2023. Yeah, I know. Time flies, Where, doesn't it? Where's the time going? <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell me about that, that first, uh, uh, sighting that you saw there. Well, uh, it was kind of caught us off guard. We're on a, a pretty crystal clear day. Uh, you know, not high serious clouds on a flight routine charter flight from Sandpoint, Alaska to, uh, Dutch Harbor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we were about oh, an hour into the flight, I would say. And going by an active volcano by the name of Mount Shishalden, that's uh, 9,404 uh, feet above uh, sea level, straight mm -hmm. up from the water. And uh, we spotted something about 30 miles beyond the mountain as we were approaching it. It's, it's on a regular flight path. Uh, and uh, that particular day, we were bucking some winds at about 20 knots and uh, chose to go on the northwest side of the mountain just because of turbulent possible turbulence if we were on the other side right. uh anyhow so we were cruising along and we were about 10 miles uh before the mountain and spotted some kind of horizontal disc shaped ring with a little wisp coming from the tail of it 
it wasn't an actual saucer, but it was a ring perfectly symmetrical in a horizontal fashion. And that ring was, yeah, we estimated 20 to 30 miles past the mountain. Okay. Um, and it was real visible. So it had to be fairly large. I mean, it was at least, a, I, want, I want to say a good, a good half mile or three quarters of a mile wide. Mm-hmm. I want to say because if we could see it that far away i mean it had to be fairly significant right um and we just so we kept motoring on on our flight path and just you know this object or disc or smoke ring or whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it caught our attention and it basically moved towards the mountain with the wind we were bucking wind and we were going against the wind it was going with the wind and it sort of it kind of changed shape and so went from perfectly symmetrical in a horizontal fashion and then uh, actually sort of turned vertical and became more of a circle shape, but not a perfect circle. I right. mean, it wasn't, it was more like an oblong type of shape. I've got quite a few pictures of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it sort of came up again, uh, you know, about two miles on the s- east side of the mountain and sort of parked. Uh, so, the only reason I say it, it was moving, but then as we were flying by, it sort of stopped and stayed in one position. Mm-hmm. Now, when you encounter normal clouds, or if if you see like a smoke ring like that, as it travels or, and the wind pushes it, it, it'll lose its shape and kind of tear apart, correct? Yeah, that's what I would have thought. Uh, mm-hmm. I called the Volcanic Advisor, uh, obs- uh, Observatory about it, and gave him the pictures they claimed it was a smoke ring i said well it might have been a smoke ring but smoke rings don't hold their shape in 20 knots of wind and up and upper levels that that particular ring was probably at about the oh i want to say the thirteen thousand foot level Mm -hmm. winds are pretty significant at that altitude right so any sort of smoke ring would have not held its shape if it indeed would have come out of let's just say that particular volcano it would have dissipated pretty quick right uh it might have went with the wind for a minute or two and then lost its shape uh there are other volcanoes to the southwest of shishaldan that could have possibly spit that smoke ring out but again with that kind of wind up there it's not going to hold its shape so that's why this whole thing got my attention Mm -hmm. it's like wait this is not something normal here this should be long gone and it wasn't so your point's taken uh Mm -hmm. and it's correct it would have uh, dissipated and when you when you call the uh volcano um i forgot what you call it um it's is it the the volcano wasn't erupting or producing plumes of smoke at the time was it uh not very wisps uh the volcano this was the interesting part the volcano became active about a week before that it's an off and on volcano Mm -hmm. which means uh sometimes it's real active sometimes not so much uh Mm -hmm. this and then it can lay dormant for years a year or two six months maybe eight months yeah uh this particular time uh it had been active so it it was shooting some very small whiffs, wisps of uh, uh, white smoke out, some steam, mm-hmm. but no visible ash to speak of. And it wasn't in a, any sort of major eruption mode. It was just uh, basically venting. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you know, I, I know there's been reports in Alaska in the mountains and everything that there's a lot of uh, UAP or UFO activity out there somewhere. So, I mean, this could have been, you know, possibly a portal, a wormhole that was opening up or something that you, you happen to witness. Uh, yeah, that's, well, the thing that kind of caught my attention, it was beyond the mountain 20 miles and then it sort of floated mm-hmm. over and parked and then went sideways. And I think you're absolutely right. Something, something was up over there. Uh, you know, it, when it turned hor- uh, you know, into a vertical fashion, you know, first it's going along in a horizontal and then it turned this way. Yeah. So I'm going to park by the mountain. And so as we're going by, and this all happened in a period of about, you know, I want to say maybe eight minutes, six mm-hmm. to eight minutes, because we were 
cruising at a, you know, basically 200 miles an hour going by this mountain. We see something uh, initially, then it comes over and parks. And by this time we're on the side of the mountain and all this happened pretty quickly. So as we're watching the sphere, we're watching the mountain, something, a wisp of smoke with something inside of the, of it, a black object. And normally when the mountain's venting, it's either black or it's white, but not both. And you mm -hmm. can see something pretty visible inside this white little shroud of smoke. Look like a look like a top almost. And you can see sort of a vortices coming off the top of it. And this sort of popped out of the mountain. We're taking pictures. So it's real hard to define as we're taking pictures. We're not really watching the sphere anymore. We're watching what's coming out of the mountain. And we're sort of, you know, toggling back and forth saying okay and then uh and and just within a, a couple of frames later after this uh this object comes out of the mountain all of a sudden that sphere that is sitting on the side of the mountain in a vertical like a vertical ring much like as you said a portal mm -hmm. uh something flies in it we didn't see the object fly into it because we something else happened on the mountain there was a green sphere down towards the middle of the mountain that sort of appeared for not long, mm -hmm. uh, which we got pictures of that too. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't see it move. We just got pictures of it. And then all this is happening at a pretty fairly high rate of speed. So we look back up at the sphere and something had flown into the sphere and pulled it into sort of a noose. So what was a normal ring, now the top of that ring had a sort of a, a neck so to speak, is something was pulling that ring towards upper atmosphere. And really? the ring had turned into sort of a teardrop shape, perfect teardrop. And we have pictures of that too. Uh, so at that point, something really crazy is going on. We're looking at all this. I got passengers aboard and I'm going, yeah, it's time to, we need to uh, bug out of here. So you, did you ever think of, I mean, on. if if passengers weren't in the in the plane, would you have maybe gone closer to it and see if you can get a better look at it or you know thinking back now um probably not but my curiosity level was at an all-time high at that point mm -hmm. and i'm always thinking well what if i would have went over there and really checked it out um but at the same time uh yeah there's been so many weird occurrences yeah. in alaska aircraft disappearances for absolutely no reason at all with good equipment, good pilots. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I was thinking, you know, I don't want to get, I'm not the guy that needs to be in the paper getting read about. So we just continued yeah. on to Dutch Harbor and uh, the flight went uh, uneventfully uh, after that well, that's and good. returned the aircraft to Sand Point uh, that just uh, an hour and a half later. And there was uh, nothing happening at the mountain at that point. Wow. I mean, so, I mean all, all this so, stuff going on, <laughs> were you paying attention to where the plane was going? <laughs> I mean, I'd be looking at well, everything that's else. Just, yeah. You know, that's the thing. We're trying to take pictures. I'm also looking for possible traffic. You, yeah. there, occasionally you'll get marine uh, birds up there at that level. So you got to be watching for birds, traffic. But, you know, we're in a pretty secluded part of the state. There's not a lot of air travel going on there just because of the proximity. And there's a way, a way out, you know. Yeah, long way, long way from Kansas, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that really wasn't our concern, but you still got to be paying attention. Yeah, uh, to exactly. your flight path. So yeah, so taking pictures, paying attention to the aircraft, making sure we're still on course, trying to watch the sphere. Saw a green orb on the side of the mountain. Saw something fly out of the mountain. Uh, all this recorded on pictures. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of comments. This kind of went on YouTube after the initial show uh, in Aliens in Alaska. And I got a lot of comments. Mm -hmm. says, well, why didn't you video it? You're trying to, there's just no way you can take a video that would give right. it credibility uh, because of the proc how far the initial object was. But pictures, however, if, they're, if you got a good megapixel camera, mm -hmm. can be enlarged. Mm -hmm. And you can actually get a pretty good look. Now, I wish I would have had a 24 megapixel camera at that point. Yeah. I was shooting this off my phone, but I believe it was a 12 megapixel. Yeah. Uh, which still gave us some pretty good clarity. Uh, not as great yeah. as I would have wanted. But still, it was uh, it was no mistake in what we were seeing. 
And, you know, you know, taking a movie and trying to fly a plane, like you said, trying to watch everything, I mean, that's going to be kind of hard to do. I mean, taking a picture is hard enough, but holding it up there and actively uh, virtually you know, keeping impossible. it in there. And, yeah. No, it yeah. would have been virtually impossible, especially if you're trying to zoom in, fly the airplane. It was just, yeah, there was a lot, yeah. there's way too much going on. And and it, the, the video would have been jerky, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're trying to zoom in, and then there would have been no... Uh, you know, when I tried to take the pictures, I tried to keep the mountain in view so you could see how the proximity was changing of this right. object. It wasn't right. just in one spot. It was moving, uh, which was strange. I mean, you know, yeah. at the very least, it was not normal. And I've right. seen thousands and thousands of clouds, you know, 20,000 flight hours. I've seen about mm -hmm. everything. And I don't claim to have seen everything, but I've seen about it everything yeah exactly there's always something new and you're always learning something new in an airplane and if yeah. you keep that sort of mind intact you'll do okay but the second yeah. you think you know it all or seen it all you're in for problems yeah now you said the other one was six months later than this six months later uh first one happened in late october the second one in late april Mm -hmm. uh again the mountain had calmed down and went dormant and all of a sudden about a week before the second occurrence the mountain started up again wow. uh this was a com this was quite a bit different and even to be honest more chilling uh i was by myself in a different aircraft same sort of model aircraft on another company aircraft not the same one mm -hmm. Uh, and it was the same deal. We were a routine flight going into Dutch Harbor to pick up some folks. I was empty at this point, so I was by myself. And it was a crystal clear day. There were no clouds, no anything. So uh, since the first occurrence, uh, I was a very candid audience when I was flying by this mountain. So mm -hmm. I was always ready to hopefully see something. And, and not sort of wishing for what I didn't want, but... At the same time, curious of what might be there. Yeah. Uh, so I'm coming along, taking pictures of the mountain, and just a beautiful, clear day. And uh, there's not one cloud in the sky. I've got pictures to prove that. All of a sudden, I looked out my left window as I'm going by the mountain. And in the exact same spot where that particular cloud smoke ring mm -hmm. went vertical and stopped, there was a shrouded cloud that appeared out of nowhere because I didn't see it going in mm -hmm. and I wasn't really paying attention. Again, I'm looking forward, controlling the airplane, making sure everything's good. It's a clear day, nothing to see here. Right. Look out my left window and all of a sudden there's a large cloud that appeared out of nowhere. Shrouded, looked like it was came out of, I don't know what, but there was an object inside of it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like going, All right, what the heck? And I'm like looking and I'm like, going, okay, camera time. So yeah. I'm taking pictures. And again, I'm putting the mountain in perspective of where this object was. And if you compare the two occurrences, it's pretty much the exact same spot. Really? Now, this cloud was large. It had a lot of wisps towards the back and towards the front of this cloud. Um, and I sent you pictures of this. Yeah, and I'll put these uh, pictures up as well here. Yeah, uh, the cloud appeared to be, well, how do I put it? Whatever object was in there appeared to be very cold because it looked like the air was like freeze dried around. And I, maybe I'm using the wrong term here, but when you see super cooled air, it looks very, not frothy, but loose. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was noticing that in the pictures. So what happened was, and this is all in a period of about five to six minutes again, uh, this object inside there started to change. Uh, it became more defined, uh, more active. There were things going on inside of this cloud that it was either trying to cloak itself in. And, you know, again, I've seen a lot of clouds. I've seen... Uh, you know, and the pictures speak for themselves. It's yeah. obvious there's something right there. Now, maybe you one could say it was warm air coming out of the mountain and hitting cold air and created some sort of crazy cloud. Okay, uh, I might be able to buy that. But yeah. to be honest, 
when you look at this cloud and it, seeing how it came out of nowhere, the mountain wasn't that active. Yeah. The mountain had a little bit of uh, steam that was just rolling down the side of the mountain downwind of it. So it wasn't like it was puffing a bunch of hot air. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this object, cloud, shroud, cloak, whatever you want to call it, appeared. And it morphed into something pretty damn crazy. I mean, it, yeah. it kept getting more defined, more defined. Uh, something was going on below this craft. It looked like it had a vortice coming out of the back of it, some sort of tail with a some sort of propulsion, it looked like to me. But again, you know, I'm looking at the pictures and one can only you know, speculate what was actually happening. Right. Right. Uh, but as I went by and I kept going again, I'm on a direct course for Dutch Harbor and I'm continuing that course. So we have sunlight to deal with this. A lot of the problem with taking pictures out of an aircraft is with its uh, plexiglass windows on mm -hmm. these particular aircraft. And uh, when there's sun in the glare, uh, you'll start to lose what, would be a real clear picture becomes more hazy and more hazy as the glare starts to reflect off the plexiglass. So as I was sort of uh, motoring towards Dutch Harbor, I'm still taking many pictures. I probably took 25 pictures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the trajectory, trajectory of the picture taking in the aircraft and the object was fading as the aircraft continued on its course. That being said, as that was all happening, the this object morphed into something that I couldn't even begin to even speculate what it was. But it looked like a craft with a wing, a landing gear, or something crazy. But you see it in the pictures I sent you. Yeah. Um, it came, it turned from a very large, a larger craft. Uh, and then had activity below it, either uh, it looked, it almost looked like tentacles or something or, or something coming out of the bottom of it that was mm -hmm. either doing something with another craft or something. But I mean, it's all real visible. Yeah. And then, uh, and then the whole craft turned into something that I can't even say what it was. Almost looked like a space shuttle out of Star Trek, but it had arms and legs. I mean, and I'm not kidding when I say that. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you look at you look at those pictures, and so when I, you know, looked at it all, and I'm like, on. <laughs> and again, it was, it was uh, the pictures were not as clear as the initial ones mm -hmm. at the end of this picture shoot and this occurrence. Mm -hmm. But when I went back. And uh, through a little contrast in the pictures to, to actually see exactly what we were looking at, right. it's pretty astounding. Yeah. I'm a big uh, fan of um, the TV show uh, Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch. And, and they've been doing tests where they take a helicopter over the ranch. And the instruments kind of mess up. The, you know, the, the GPS is, is off. And it, and it tells you that they're, they're, they're lower in the sky than they are. Did anything happen to you in your airplane when you were doing that, when you're flying this? That's a good point. Uh, while this was all going on, there was, not, uh, there was no anomalies with the aircraft. I went to Dutch Harbor, which was about another 40 minutes from that area, mm -hmm. landed. And I, I believe I was on a freight mission because I came back alone again. So I think I had parts or something in that aircraft. But on the way back, um, again, candid audience, same route of flight, mm -hmm. um, flight path, trajectory, everything is the same, except for now I got a little bit of tailwind and everything is as advertised, except mm -hmm. for at about 10 miles from the mountain, I'm staring at the mountain, I'm not really paying too much attention to the airplane because we're on autopilot, everything as as advertised. Mm -hmm. um, I look down at my heading and I'm 30 degrees off, pointed straight for the mountain. I was probably seven miles away from the mountain outside of it. I wasn't really heading straight for it, uh, but my flight path would probably take me four, four miles outside the mountain. So, you know, we weren't like mm -hmm. dead up against this mountain at all. We were, we were basically flying by in a flight path that took us away from, you know, not, not close right. to it. Right. But I looked down and the autopilot was, uh, I mean, our flight pass was 30 degrees off. So I'm like going, okay, what the heck? 
Um, so I, and, you know, I've flown a lot with autopilots. Occasionally you'll have an issue, but this particular aircraft and that autopilot, it's been really solid. Yeah. So I looked at it and I go, okay, well, what's going on here? So I flipped it off, uh, corrected the aircraft's course back on course mm -hmm. and on a flight trajectory back to Sandpoint, set up the autopilot again, and then started, started paying attention to the mountain again, looking for anything that might be going on. I looked down about two minutes later and here we are. Once again, we're 30 degrees off course heading straight for the mountain. I'm like, on oh, what the heck is going on here? So I'm thinking, oh. okay, I must have an issue with the autopilot. Yeah. I'm not really thinking that at the time, you know, I'm not thinking is the, is the mountain drawing the aircraft toward it because of a magnetic disturbance. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking that at the time. I'm thinking equipment failure. Right, you know, because I, I just wasn't really putting two to two together. Right. Uh, so I, uh, I manually I switched the autopilot autopilot off, manually fly the aircraft by the mountain on the same flight path. Uh, mm -hmm. We're cruising, and about fifteen miles past, I'm thinking, okay, I got to try this autopilot again. I got to see what's going on here. So I flipped the autopilot on. It was perfect all the way back to Sandpoint. Never had an anomaly. Really. So that was really strange. Uh, but that happened. Uh, the funny thing was, is that initially on the first flyby when we had the occurrence, yeah, there was no magnetic, magnetic disturbance. But after we came back, there was something going on over there. And it was telling the aircraft, no, you come this way. You know, wow. uh, those, what happens, those, the autopilots are, are hooked up to a magnetic compass. And these compasses are very, very fine tuned. They're very mm -hmm. expensive. A very intricate part of the aircraft yeah so when one starts to uh get pulled away these things are designed to you know magnetic north all the time they're, they they mm -hmm. know where they're at they're supposed to be but when you have a magnetic disturbance like that it will pull that compass off mm -hmm. uh at this particular time it did not once but twice till we got by the mountain so mountain had a magnetic draw not sure what that was all about uh, if it had something to do, obviously must have had something to do, but yeah, uh, it's been a, yeah, um, I've probably flown past that mountain a hundred times since then. Uh, and every time I'm always thinking about it, always looking, haven't seen anything, but there's and, a village about 30 miles. Oh, go ahead, sir. And have you, um, had any more problems with the uh, autopilot pa uh, flying past that mountain? No, no, never. No, not really? at all. No. Um, huh. well, none that none that I could actually record and put my finger on, you know. Uh, I haven't yeah. really been thinking about that anymore. Too busy looking at the mountain, yeah. but it hasn't, you know, pulled me off course, but anything like that. But what I was getting at earlier, there's a village about 30 miles uh, below that mountain to the northeast side of it. Yeah. A small village called False Pass. And I've talked to a lot of old timers there and they've told me that there is a lot of, a lot of activity in the evening that they've seen. Uh, they can't quite put their finger on it, but a lot of light lights buzzing around and really crazy things going on in the sky. And these are old timers, not anybody, you know, they have no reason to be making anything up, Yeah, but yeah, there's definitely something going on over there. And, you know, this has been sort of a, uh, UAP MO, so to speak, a lot of uh, volcanoes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to a gentleman, uh, David Childress, about a lot of this stuff. And he says, yeah, there's been a lot of occurrences around volcanoes, especially when they're active. Yeah. So uh, that being said, uh, you know, uh, yeah. whether, whether there was or not, uh, I think something was going on not once, but twice. And that, and to me, that's really rare to see something. At, oh, and then the other part was it was exactly the same time in the morning when I went on really? both of those flights at ten fifteen a.m. in the morning, and I believe one was ten seventeen. And I didn't really realize this till I went back and looked at the time signature on the pictures, and I go, "Well, that's odd." Yeah, you, know, that you is don't really weird. think about that. Till you, you look back, and it's like, so I like to do the morning flights. Yeah. Um, I'm always happy when I'm departing about 10, 930 in the morning when I'm going to go 
by that mountain just because, <laughs> hey, if that's the time they're over there having breakfast, yeah. I'd like to go out and see what they're doing. <laughs> so so if, you're, doing something. if you're a passenger of Theo's and you go by that mountain around 10, 15 or whatever in the morning, make sure you have your video camera ready. Just That's in case. Correct. <laughs> Passenger wise, not pilot wise, right? <laughs> that may not be good advertising. Okay. <laughs> hey, I'd buy it. <laughs> I'd go. Right? Come on yeah. now. We'll check it out. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, you know, have you, you've never witnessed anything like this in any other part of the country that you've flown in, have you? No, no, not flying. Um, we commercial fish during the summertime in the mm-hmm. Bering Sea. We've seen a couple of occurrences out there, but nothing to this magnitude. Yeah, um, We've seen strange lights and stuff at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning that probably shouldn't have been there. But, yeah. um, you know, very, very rare when we've heard other guys that have fished the Bering Sea, which is, by the way, right on the doorstep of this mountain as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah there's uh well, that's just uh yeah no, nothing to this magnitude yeah well theo this is really awesome and you know when i first started talking to you and actually before that when i saw your story on the history channel my my arm hairs were standing up this was it was freaky it was, it was pretty darn cool then yeah. you know talking to you more this is this is very very interesting and you know i i wish i could just come up there right now and do that do the interview you know with you in the plane or something and maybe see something that would be pretty cool well, at some point, you should come to Alaska, and we will definitely uh, take a flight. Uh, may not be around that mountain, but we'll definitely show you some of the yeah. better sites of Alaska, and uh, who knows what's out there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Theo, I really appreciate you taking the time to um, chat with us. Um, it's telling me that the time's about, we are about eight minutes left. Um, so, I mean, I, I appreciate you taking the time. Stay safe out in the air, and uh, thank you again. Appreciate it. You too, my friend. And if you need any more information, any more pictures, feel free to email me, call me, or text. All right, we'll do. Thank you. And there you have it, Theo Chesley from up in Alaska. What a great story that was uh, that he had. Let me know what you think. I want to hear it. Uh, leave it in the comments below, or you can email me at paranormalamongus72 at gmail.com. Thanks to Theo for joining us. Uh, once again. Also, if you had a paranormal story that you would like to share, or if you would like to be a guest on the show, uh, send me an email at paranormalamongus72 at gmail.com. Next week, we are going to be back on schedule live. Um, We will have uh, Night Owls Paranormal of Missouri on. It's going to be a very interesting show. Uh, I am looking forward to this one. It's going to be fun. You don't want to miss that. So make sure that you are subscribed and you have that bell rung for notifications uh, for the show for next week. Uh, That's all I got for this week. Uh, Thank you all so much for watching. Stay safe out there, everybody, and I will see you on the next episode of Paranormal. Paranormal.